Good evening and um, welcome to the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures Virtual Artists uh, Talks. This is a series that we do um, when we are debuting new exhibits. Um, and we're very fortunate this evening to be able to have um, uh, Abraham Mergadichian's son, uh, Robert Mergadichian, who's going to be talking about his father's artwork that he created. Um, we're very, uh, very excited to have that on display here at the Mini Time Machine Museum. Um, as many of you probably know, we are located in Tucson, Arizona. Um, Robert is speaking to us from Massachusetts. So we've got um, guests joining us from all over the country. So we really appreciate that. Um, a few, uh, as I mentioned, there are a few little housekeeping details that I wanted to um, just share with you before we get started. Um, the first one of those is that we are recording this Zoom presentation, and so um, please keep that in mind. Um, we are also um, asking that you mute your mics when you're um, in this in this presentation. Um, you will have the opportunity to type questions if you would like in the chat box, um, and then I can share those with Robert at the end. Uh, if you don't want to, to ask your questions um, through the chat feature, you can definitely um, wait and ask some questions at the end um, by uh, just unmuting your mic. And so you're welcome to do that. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I think maybe we've got everyone connected now. So um, again, um, my name is Mackenzie Massman. I am the Director of Education and Associate Director here at the Mini Time Machine Museum of Miniatures. Um, I am very excited to introduce uh, Robert Mergadichian, who's going to be speaking tonight. Um, Robert's father, Abraham Mergadichian, was a machinist who worked his entire career in a factory making aircraft engine parts. Um, in his spare time, Abe cra uh, crafted from scrap metal his interpretations of miniature everyday objects, which of course is very important to us here at the Mini Time Machine Museum. Um, at the time of his passing in 1983, Abe left behind hundreds of objects, many of which he had made as gifts to friends and family members. And I have to say, I'm pretty jealous of those friends and family um, that got to have these wonderful pieces um, as gifts. Uh, in 2013, Abe's son, Robert, and his wife, Becky, opened a crate that Abe himself had made and locked and that, that contained many of his art pieces. After documenting the pieces, Robert committed himself to the mission of uh, to have Abe recognized as a bona fide artist and have his machine uh, manufactured pieces um, recognized as uh, art forms that they are. Um, since then, Robert has had pieces exhibited in nearly two dozen uh, venues um, in New England, virtually in California, and then now here at the Mini Time Machine Museum in, um, in Arizona. Um, Robert has also just learned, and this is very exciting, that the National Toy and Miniature Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, um, has offered him the opportunity to display um, Abe's artwork um, and that will be uh, happening in early 2023. Um, in conjunction with his uh, quest regarding uh, Abe's creations, Robert um, enrolled in a graduate level nonprofit management program at Worcester State University in Massachusetts, um, hoping to ultimately open the Mergadichian Museum to feature this artwork. In May, Robert completed his studies and received his Master of Science. So congratulations on that. He was also successful in securing a grant uh, from the Worship State Foundation um, for the exhibit here at the Mini Time Machine Museum. So we're, we're very appreciative of that as well. Um, Robert owns an archi architectural consulting business and another business restoring baseball gloves. And the Boston Globe has called him the glove whisperer. Um, Robert is delighted to join us here tonight, and his talk is entitled Metal Artist Abri Abraham Mergadichian's Confounding Choice of Subject Matter. So Robert, I'd like to turn it over to you and give you an opportunity to share this wonderful artwork with our audience. 
Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, it's a pleasure to be back with you. I was there at the opening day uh, and had just a heck of a great time. So here we are uh, towards the end of the exhibit. I'm sorry to say, but we're back and uh, I, I look forward to another nice um, uh, opportunity here. I wanna give a shout out to my family that I see and I've seen some of my friends. I don't see a big list of people here, so I don't know who's listening and I don't, you know, I, I, I can't call them out, but I don't wanna embarrass anybody. But uh, thank you to those who are watching that I, the folks I know. Um, so I'm just going to ask, uh, I will say, you know, I'll, you know, advance to the next slide, okay? All right, so we're going to start. Nope, that's the last one. Okay. All right, so the talk uh, is entitled Metal Artist Abraham Megardichian's Confounding Choice of Subject Matter. Uh, for over 50 years, I have been astounded by the art my dad, Abraham Megardichian, machined from solid scrap metal. Even as kids, my sisters and I, along with mom, became accustomed and blessed to receive his unique art objects for our birthdays and as our Christmas presents. Dad was a machinist by profession and what others would describe as a tinkerer. It was totally natural that he would begin his 30 year hobby making utilitarian objects for use at home from ashtrays to paperweights to a yo-yo Dad seemed to make his interpretation of nearly everything. What wasn't obvious then, nor is it now, was how he chose his subject matter. Dad served in the Navy, so I can understand he might wanna make some military themed objects. Okay, Mackenzie, next. Okay. What's hard to grasp is why he chose naval cannons from a much earlier period to be his subjects, such as his all aluminum one of 1970. Next. And his solid copper one was steel cannonballs made before 1970. Next. And similarly with his solid brass ship. The type of ship dad created makes me wonder. His choice was a destroyer, also known as a tin can, yet he served aboard an LCI, short for Landing Craft Infantry. Next. A relatively short, squatty, flat bottomed ship designed to transport supplies and Marines right up onto the beaches and short distances, such as from island to island in the Philippines where he served. This is a photo of dad's ship, LCI number 685. Why didn't he model his art piece after an LCI? Could it be he may have preferred to have served on a more sleek and perhaps more dangerous destroyer? Next. In 1973, Dad created his full-size candlestick telephone, nearly 20 pounds of solid copper, an artwork that I got exhibited at the New Hampshire Telephone Museum in its own special and structurally sound glass display case. Several questions arise. Why didn't Dad make a phone like those more in vogue in the early 1970s? What hold did nostalgia have over him that he would recreate a phone style exi existent 50 years before he made it? How much did he love us as a family that he would schlep this creation from his workplace to his car, not exactly close by? When we asked him at the time, he merely said, yeah, what of it? Next. On a smaller scale, in 1979, Dad made his garbage pail. Next. 
and next. Dad modeled it after a device that many urban folks like myself had in their backyards. Next. Some of you may be familiar with such a device. For those of you who aren't, a garbage man, they were all men at that time, came to the backyard, stepped on the foot pedal to open the lid to the garbage bucket that was set inside a concrete casing that was installed in the ground. So what you're seeing is the concrete casing. And then he took the uh, pail into which the homer, homeowners had deposited their, foot, their food waste. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back, please. OK, sorry. Uh, the man carried the pail. To, so there was a hop. There was a pail inside of this. And he carried that pail to the hopper truck and dumped the contents into the truck. It's hard to ma imagine that anyone other than the designer of such a functional device could have had any interest in such an inherently unpleasant device. But dad did. Next. After I got engaged to my wife, Becky, dad made for her his version of a kitchen knife, complete with Becky's name and the year engraved on it. Could dad actually have thought the knife was a fitting gift for a bride-to-be? Appropriateness of gifts was a concept that dad apparently had different views on. Next. So when I was only four months old, dad made, a set, made me a set of toy trucks. I repeat, I was only four months old. Here he is in his home workshop working on the six inch by four inch by four inch solid aluminum tractor, solid aluminum tractor. It weighed nearly three pounds and was painted with who knows what type of paint. Three inter interchangeable trailers for the tractor were a box trailer, which is shown here, but you can advance. And there it is. And next, this is a car carrier with ramps. And next, this is a wood carrier. None of the pieces have the small, the smoothest of edges and the carrier's logs were actually broken broomsticks complete with jagged edges and likely leaded paint. The paint may be excusable since the effects of lead paint on children were probably not known at the time dad made these pieces, but rough edges. Perhaps dad was thinking that someday like now, I would quote, appreciate the trucks from decades earlier. Well, maybe dad never intended these objects as toys, next. Dad called his Piscine creation a whale, though it looks more like a fish, with a vertical as opposed to horizontal tail fin. Did Dad know the difference? Did he care? Or was he simply amusing us? Perhaps he was exercising artist's prerogative. Two industrial pieces are baffling. First, the trash can. Next. So from a machinist's point of view, Dad's trash can is quite an exquisite piece of machining with its sloping and fluted walls soldered on handles and tightly toleranced, neatly fitting lid. But as a gift, who would really appreciate a trash can except perhaps Oscar the Grouch? The next piece also has its oddity. Next, uh, it's a full size solid brass blowtorch. Dad made this one in 1981, just before he contracted cancer. What possibly could have been his motivation to create and tote such an 18 pound behemoth? Maybe he guessed he had the disease and wanted to quote, burn it away. I must admit it was very much appreciated when I got this piece exhibited at an industrial museum a few years ago. Dad would be proud. Some of Abe's pieces can only be described as enigmatic. He left behind a very large collection of metal art, nearly all of it recognizable, and all with his understated sense of style. The following pieces stand out 
of a total of over 400 as being especially perplexing. My father was not a gambler, at least I never knew him to be, but, what, but he was taken in by the concept of dice. What was so special that he incorporated dice into a multitude of his pieces? Perhaps he won big at a floating craps game on his ship during his time in the Navy. As with most of his naval service, he never mentioned any gambling. He did, however, have an affinity for backgammon. Our family background is Armenian, and many Armenians play backgammon, so it was not unusual that he would make a few sets. He created this one in 1967, the largest of several sets, though smaller than commercially sold boards. The board is aluminum, as are the opponent's stones, quote stones. The opposing stones are brass. Dad did not make the tiny white dice and likely obtained them from one of the novelty shops prevalent years ago and at which he worked briefly. Next. In this photo, my sister and I are playing in front of the half watchful eye of my father's mother who lived with us. We played hundreds of games on that set. Armenians tend to play backgammon with great enthusiasm, slapping uh, the stones loudly. Knowing that, Dad made his backgammon board out of metal anyway, adding to the already noisy decibel. Next. As gifts of art, Dad made several sets of two inch cubes in aluminum and in brass. I can't say I've seen too many solid metal dice paperweights on people's desks. Perhaps that was part of dad's rationale for making them. Or maybe he was experimenting with making perfect cubes, more challenging technically than it sounds. Next. The most curious of dad's dice themed pieces was the two and five eighths inch wide single object intended as a gift Dad wrapped it with excess wallpaper from his kitchen when such metallic paper was fashionable back in the 1970s. Obviously a die, the dot indentations appear through the paper and in their expected locations on each face. One has to ask, where was the die's mate? Who was the gift for? My mother? Not too romantic, especially since he had already made other dice. Answering the question means unwrapping the gift to see if dad dated it and correlating the date to a holiday or a family member's birthday. However, dad may not have dated the die. Let it suffice that dad has kept us guessing about this piece. Dad played around more with the theme of dice. Here's an example of bookends heavy brass ones with the dots painted in machinist blue. What is curious on this set and on other pieces in the collection are small stick on numbers. Now, I don't know if you can make this out, but on the top of the vertical piece on the right, right where you have the right there uh, is a stick on number. Not knowing what the numbers stood for on other pieces too, I've intentionally left them intact. After much speculation as to the purpose of the numbers, eventually I hypothesized they represented the weight. My suspicion proved correct. Each of the bookends weighed 16 pounds, the very number shown. Why was this important to Dad? A logical but unproven answer may be that he paid for the scrap metal by pound, maybe but the scraps would have been heavier before he machined them to their finished form. Next. My, my personal favorite, favorite pair of dice book bookends was more artistic than utilitarian. When each of us in the family graduated, dad machined for us a book, quote book, on which he engraved our names, years of graduation and school names. He even gave mom her gift, though many years after she had gotten her nursing degree. The books shown here are curious in that they're unfinished. That is, they have no names on them. 
who were they for? Dad was obviously planning to gift them in the future. Next. Mom enjoyed entertaining and using the then fashionable napkin rings. So dad made her a set of 15 copper rings, not a dozen or a baker's dozen, all likely cut from one two inch diameter pipe. Why would he go with an odd number like 15? Our dining room table didn't seat that many. Next. As a gag gift, dad, dad cut another copper pipe into 17 equal rings, each a half inch high. He then interconnected the rings into a chain that resembles a child's paper creation. But unlike paper artwork, where the pieces of scotch tape are visible, dad's assemblage shows no seams. Machinists and medical workers have scrutinized this artwork and found no telltale sign of how Abe connected the rings. When we family members asked dad the trick, he said it was a secret. Someday I'll find out what it was. I recall we hung this artwork on the family Christmas tree one year. At just over one pound total weight, the suspended artwork bent the pine branches down to their limit. Dad found that humorous. Next. My last curiosity is a savings bank for half dollars. Always encouraging his children to save, dad made us steal saving back, savings banks as Christmas presents in 1979. That's the date up there on the top of it, right there. Each was the size of a half gallon milk container and painted a distinguishing color of black, rust, red, or gold. Each had a slot on the top into which a half dollar would comfortably squeeze through. Dad seeded each bank with a half dollar coin and encouraged us to put those special coins into the banks as often as possible. Half dollars were more common in circulation now. The mystery with the banks is that dad provided no way to open them. Since they were welded, opening the banks requires the use of an acetylene torch. There's the rub. Are the banks to be opened when full or are the banks to remain as pieces of art, regardless of how much money is inside? How many half dollars do the banks hold? Is there any sort of personal note inside? Opening them would obviously ruin the artwork. It may have been dad's intent that we kids would ask him to pry open the banks when they became full. But then perhaps the banks were all a joke that dad enjoyed playing on us. Either way, dad didn't live long enough for the banks to fill up. Next, I've shown this pendant as one example of the Abe's 80 pieces of jewelry. The aluminum pendant happens to incorporate a Kennedy half dollar. I may never be able to resolve the questions I have raised about my father's art, but then do I need to? I'm thankful to have the magnificent collection he left behind. I leave you with one more question. Have you enjoyed seeing some of Abraham Megardician's art only a fraction of how much I have enjoyed presenting it to you? Thank you very much. Now, Here's a picture of my father. I forget what the date is on this one. It's, uh, I think it's, I'm sorry, in the late 70s, I think. Um, this one has a date of 71. 71, okay. Uh, so one last thing. The, the glasses that I'm wearing right now, these glasses, are those very glasses in, the, in this photograph. Uh, except for the lenses being changed. Um, so here's the, um, I'm, and this is the last thing I'm showing, oh, or are you, I have the web page, that's all. Uh, this is the, uh, the web page for those of you who would like to see it. Uh, may I direct a question, Mackenzie? Joan, what Absolutely. can you, this, I'm talking to my sister, Joan. What color was your bank? Oh, gold. You you got the gold one? Uh -huh. And how how full is it? Do we tell them? 
one quarter. <laughs> Don't tell me you opened it. <laughs> okay. All right. Oops. Don't answer any more questions. You got to leave me in suspense. Um, so uh, I'm I'm open to questions from anybody. Um, we'll definitely take questions from the audience, but I was hoping that maybe you would answer a couple of questions that I actually had for you. Go ahead. Um, the, the first one that I had is um, for your father, was there a specific type of metal that he preferred to work with or was he just any type of metal? Um, what was his what was his favorite? Did he ever explain that or, or tell you? Um, now, remember, he's making aircraft engine parts and uh, the metals that he had access to were the metals that ended up in aircraft engines. And those were primarily brass and aluminum. Uh, copper, you saw several copper pieces. I think he liked copper. Uh, we didn't have that many objects that were in copper. It's got that beautiful you know, red color. Uh, and then the jewelry was uh, mostly aluminum. I think that uh, there was also some titanium. There was certainly some uh, stainless steel, which ended up as some rings. Uh, that's the hardest of all the metals, hard in terms of density, I guess. Uh, but most of the pieces were either brass or aluminum. I think uh, to answer your question, I think the answer is aluminum because it was the easiest uh, metal to turn on a lathe. Okay, so uh, we do have uh, an opportunity for other people to ask questions. Um, Please uh, feel free to unmute your mic and you can go ahead and ask if there's something that you would like to um, have explained or, or have additional information, that would be great. If we don't have any questions, I have more. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so, um, so one question that I had, you mentioned several times that um, your, your father, you know, made these, made these wonderful pieces of art and gave them away as gifts. Um, so does that mean that you have a pretty good idea about where most of them ended up or are they, are there some that you're not sure where they are? Is there, a, you know, are these going to show up on eBay? Is that something that's going to happen or do you pretty much know that family have them and they and know where they are? Um, most of the people who are not family who got these gifts, um, I think still have them. Uh, these folks know what's going on with this collection and uh, they're cherishing those objects as well as their memory of my father. Uh, I know that uh, the, the gifts went to, uh, I know certain people they went to and among those people was the, this is my favorite part. It was their closest circle of friends. Uh, and there were, five couples that were able to do everything together. They went to the same church together. They lived uh, in, they had their vacations together. Um, they would have Saturday nights at one another's homes, primarily our home. Uh, and these folks got gifts. And a lot of the gifts were little bells that had uh, eagles that he attached on the top. They're in the webpage. Um, I've seen uh, some of those still on people's mantles. Um, if they ever show up on eBay, let's say I would be shocked, um, uh, but they're not my gifts. So if someone chooses to do that, that's their prerogative. I will say this though, uh, and my sister and brother-in-law are watching. My brother-in-law's sister, uh, when she got married, and I, I think it was in the 70s, uh, they got a gift of a vase from my father. Uh, and since then, they've downsized. And uh, one day at Thanksgiving, we were all together. And lo and behold, one of those vases, the one that they had gotten from my father, she brought and uh, she gave it to me. And she said, I think that, um, you know, the combination of our downsizing and with everything you've got going on with this collection, I want the piece back in the collection. Um, 
there was another individual who had gotten several pieces um, and he called me up and he said the same thing. He said, I wanna give the pieces back to you. And I, I told him that these were his gifts. And the only condition under which I would accept them would be that he would loan them to me. I said, you can call it a permanent loan. You can call it anything you want, but you are loaning them to me, which means that you can have them back anytime you want, uh, but they're back in the collection. So here's the thing, who has a collection of anything that grows after the creator of the collection you know, left X number of pieces. How can you have X plus one? Well, I do. Uh, so there's actually about X plus half a dozen. So, uh, and no, I haven't seen any on eBay. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that are in the chat. Um, one of the questions, did your father sign and date of the pieces that he crafted? Uh, did he do that for all of them? He did that for many of them, but not all of them. Um, and uh, he did have um, a punch, uh, which had, uh, it was A, it was A, M. It looked like three mountains. Um, it's also in the website. Um, some pe pieces are dated. Some pieces are uh, signed with that punch. Uh, some people have, some pe pieces have both. And then some pieces have none. Uh, and many of the pieces don't have any date. Okay, great. Another question from the chat. Um, did your father ever consider himself a miniaturist or an artist? Um, what do you think that would have meant or that label would have meant for your father? Um, I don't think that he ever considered himself either. Um, I, miniaturist is probably not a word that he would have used. Um, artist, other people considered him an artist, uh, even at the time, but I don't think that he did. A and that's, that's part of my mission. Um, you know, I, I want him to be uh, considered an artist. I want his work to be considered art. Uh, and I, I think that my family is all in agreement with me that, you know, he deserves that title and his pieces deserve that designation. Uh, but if you asked him at the time, he would have said, I have access to machines, I, may, I have access to metal, and I like giving gifts for people, so what's the big deal? I don't, I really don't, I, my sister can correct me if I'm wrong, but I really don't think that he would have said that he was an artist at the time. He was a very unassuming guy, uh, and he really liked doing things for people, and especially if they were, um, if they enjoyed it. If, you know, he got uh, pleasure out of making them happy. Uh, so there was coming back to those those friends. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, there's an object in the collection that is a set of twelve swords and there's a rack that holds the swords it's made out of brass it's made out of copper and there's some aluminum why was the number 12 because when all the people got together there were 12 of them and when they came over to my parents house um, that that arrangement was made usually by my mother and one of the women at 11 o'clock on a saturday by six o'clock, 12 people are sitting in my parents' house. And my parents, have, my mother has opened the freezer, taken out the Armenian rolls called chorek, taken out the cheese. Uh, and now they're having a great gay old time uh, with our Armenian rolls, cheese, and everybody got their own sword. And your sword was different from somebody else's sword because the hilt of each one was machined differently. So this one had an X pattern and the other one had a Z pattern, whatever. So everyone's different. So you're supposed to be able to come over the house and use a sword for your cheese, to stab your cheese, all right? Well, that's all well and good until you've had a few scotches. 
And at the end of the night, nobody could care less about the swords or who had what hilt. So he got more pleasure out of doing things like that and entertaining people, amusing people, uh, then he would have been concerned about whether he was considered an artist or anything else. So I, I have another um, quick question. So, you know, working with metal uh, can be can be dangerous. Um, were there ever any situations where he had um, injuries or problems or anything that you know about that was um, maybe so he had some suffering for uh, his creations? I think the answer is yes. I'm racking my brain to think of a specific example. Um, I, I'm sure he cut himself. Uh, these things had edges before, you know, they were all buffed down. Uh, it, with the exception of things like that car carrier that had rough edges, a lot of the things, they were so smooth. I mean, you could rub them against your face. Uh, they were amazingly smooth. But to get to that point, you know, you had to take the burrs away. And uh, that would have meant, you know, he may have cut himself. I will say this though, um, as he got older, um, he suffered from arthritis and the arthritis made his hands get really big. So he made like a ring for himself and the size would be huge. I don't know, 11 maybe. I'm guessing, but very, very large to be able to get it past his knuckles. Uh, it could not, and I don't think it was, been easy for him to hold some of these things. But to his credit, you know, these things were made with a lot of love. And uh, uh, there was an article that came out about this collection in the Boston Globe, and they called it uh, uh, 14 ounces of, of metal, one ounce of love. Uh, to create that one ounce of love uh, with arthritic fingers uh, was an amazing commitment that went on for years and years. So we're lucky to have this collection. Absolutely. And we're very lucky and honored to be able to uh, share it with the public here at the Mini Time Machine Museum in Tucson. Um, it's really wonderful. Um, it's been a very popular exhibit and we're, we're thrilled to have it. Oh, I think we have a couple people that maybe have a question. Um, Mr. Rowe, did you have a question? Hmm. Not sure if they can unmute. Um, so, I'm not sure if we can if we can hear you right now, but what I would suggest is if you want to um, submit your question, I would be happy to pass it on um, to Robert and he can um, follow up. Um, we have a just a quick comment from the from the chat that this was a truly inspiring and wonderful testament to the power of a family and I agree with that 100%. Um, Robert, thank you so much for sharing these images and sharing um, this material with us and uh, and with the the people that come and visit our museum. We're we're thrilled to be able to to share it with everyone. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wore this tie. You saw it when I was down there. But for those of you who are, are looking in now, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, my uh, youngest son gave me this as a present. So this tie has various items there's an antique car at the bottom and this is a pool table and there's a windmill uh, what's this one I don't, this is the violin uh, and then there's the toolbox he made his own toolbox uh, machinists have a very large uh, toolbox uh, with many many tools and he made his own interpretation of that uh, which was a box uh, roughly the size of a shoebox uh, and that one piece was kind of the hit of, sh of a show uh, where it was an industrial museum and his toolbox was in one case and 15 feet away was an actual toolbox from, from another machinist. They don't know each other. Uh, and so you saw the actual tools over here and you saw his tools in this little thing. When they opened it all up, there were 40 little tools and they were all like 
this big. Um, and I saw in your little uh, PowerPoint there, you had the carpenter's tools, which are down there uh, at the museum. Just uh, uh, for everyone, I guess the last things I'm gonna say, uh, I tried very carefully to uh, A, just uh, talk about pieces that are not at the museum. That was intentional. Uh, talk about things that were not necessarily miniature, but uh, had a good story behind them and, and somewhat enigmatic uh, nature. Uh, and I, I'm just, I think it went pretty well in that you've got to see a little bit of a range of what he did. Uh, over 400 pieces in the collection, uh, probably 20 different subjects could be covered in that 400. Uh, he did things as big as a full-size baseball bat down to uh, another piece that you had shown was the uh, furniture set. Well, there's a little bowl that's on top of the table and that thing is the size of a dime. Uh, and it's got some little etching on the side. So he had a huge gamut um, and pieces that were, you know, as dry as, you know, a, a garbage pail to, little pieces of tiny little pieces that had the word love written on them, uh, also in the uh, collection. Uh, there's a piece called uh, the key to happiness. It was the actual house key. So here's the house key and he put it on a, a disc about this big of aluminum. It was connected, it was one piece. Uh, so, you know, it was pretty special and, and the, the range, the ingenuity was just amazing. And now 40 plus years later, um, next February marks the 40th anniversary of his passing. Uh, so we're talking about things from 40 to 70 years ago. And I hope that they're as captivating now as, as we found them you know, 40 plus years ago. I, I really wanna thank the uh, mini time machine um, I, I keep telling them that I'm not buttering them up. I just love working with these folks. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this, this whole discussion started pre-COVID. This exhibit was supposed to, I think, be done before COVID. Um, and it, there was a lot of nurturing and a lot of uh, you know, going back and forth. Uh, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it's my true pleasure to be able to uh, address all of you, those of whom I don't know, uh, and, and my family members, my friends. Um, I'm, 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 there are people here that are in Rhode Island, New York. Uh, it's, so it's, um, uh, it, the museum is a great draw and it's a real privilege to be able to say that uh, this collection is there. So thank you. Well, thank you all so much, and we really appreciate you joining us this evening. Robert, thank you for, for sharing this artwork. And um, so we will say good night, and uh, again, hope that you can come and see the, the exhibit um, here at the museum. Um, if you are not able to come and visit us, hopefully you will check out our website. Um, I also recommend definitely checking out um, the website that was listed um, in Robert's presentation. Um, there are many pieces that are uh, featured on that website that are not on display here at the museum, but they are all amazing. So thank you so much and thank you all for joining us. Have a great night. Okay, good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, friends, for coming.